Welcome everyone. I think we'll just get started. Um, if I could ask people to keep their microphones off and cameras off as well, please. So if you have your camera on, if you could turn that off, great. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I think we'll just get started because we've got limited time today. So my name is Heather Gray. I'm the Head of Physiotherapy and Paramedicine at Glasgow Caledonian University and I'm going to be hosting the webinar today. So this webinar is part of the current enhancement theme, Evidence for Enhancement, Improving the Student Experience. Enhancement themes are funded by QAA Scotland and delivered in collaboration with Scottish sector institutions and theme activity is one of the five elements of the Scottish Quality Enhancement Framework. Enhancement Theme Activity works at different levels and this webinar is part of the Student Mental Wellbeing Collaborative Cluster. Um, collaborative clusters are designed to support groups of institutions to work together on topics of mutual benefit. So this um, Student Mental Wellbeing Collaborative Cluster, we ran a very successful face-to-face -face event earlier in the year and we were due to have two follow-up face-to-face events at the end of April. But sadly, these had to be cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, this online event is the first of three that will replace that face-to-face -face activity. So this cluster has been led by Glasgow Caledonian University in collaboration with Harriet Watt University, University of Stirling and Sparks, that's Student Partnerships in Quality Scotland. Its aim is to develop a range of resources that will help staff create learning and teaching environments that are inclusive and promote student mental well-being, something that's especially important in the current climate. So Gareth Hughes is our speaker today. He's a psychotherapist and research lead for student well-being at the University of Derby. Gareth also works for Student Minds and was the lead author of the University Mental Health Charter. He gave a fantastic presentation at our last face-to-face -face event in January, so it is back again by popular demand. Also assisting in the background today, we have Dr. Shiv Shamugam from GCU and Claire Parks from QAA Scotland. So today, Gareth is going to take us through his presentation. Um, he'll answer questions at two points during the session and also there'll be a chance at the, at the end. So please use the chat function to post any questions that you have to him. So we won't be using any microphones or cameras today, just the chat function, okay? So we'll get through as many questions as possible during the presentation. Additionally, if you want to use a chat function to perhaps highlight any resources that might help others, then please provide us with the details. And what we can do is we can add these to the resources that we're collating and posting on the Collaborative Cluster webpage. Um, finally, we'll be recording this session. I hope someone's recording it now. And we'll make it available on the Cluster webpage um, after this webinar. And for those of you who use Twitter, the hashtag is on the screen there and it's hashtag themes wellbeing. So hashtag themes wellbeing. So without any further delay, what I'll do is I'll hand over to Gareth just now. Thank you very much, Gareth. Thank you, Heather, and thank you everybody for um, joining us today. Um, it's, uh, it, it goes without saying that these are unusual times, but hopefully the session today will be useful to you uh, and hopefully also to your students in time um, as we work our way through this um, era that we're experiencing at the moment. So um, if we begin, as Heather said, I, I, I did speak at the event um, earlier in the year and um, that session was recorded and so I, I think that's still available if you want to go back and look at that. And that covered a lot of the basics around what we know in terms of um, the relationship between student mental well-being and teaching and learning and things that we need to be thinking about in the normal environment. The session today is building on that so I'm not going to be repeating anything that I covered back then but it is available if you want to go back and listen to it. And I want to look specifically at what we know at the moment about happening with student mental health um, during the COVID-19 pandemic and also what we need to be thinking about as we go through the next few months, thinking about um, coming up beginning September, October, depending on when your institution is thinking of doing that. And then what we might need to think about as we go through all of that. But I want to begin really um, by thinking about 
something that's kind of crucially important to the center of all of this, which is that when we're thinking about student well-being, um, you as staff absolutely matter. Um, your well-being is as important as the well-being of our students, and it's something we absolutely must not lose sight of in all of this, because I think it would be quite easy for that to happen. Now, your well-being matters for a number of reasons. First of all, it matters simply because you're human beings, and like, and like anyone else, your well-being is absolutely important, and it's right that you should be as entitled to good well-being and to good mental health as much as anyone else. It's also important because the well-being of university staff does impact on the well-being of university students and it impacts in a number of ways. First of all, a lot of the work that we did in the research for the University Mental Health Charter identified first that students are absolutely aware when their academic staff particularly are experiencing poor well-being or when they're experiencing good well-being and that that impacts on them. And in particular, there's a kind of modeling of behavior that happens so that if students see academics struggling with their well-being, overwhelmed, stressed, then they feel that they need to be in that position too if they're taking their studies seriously. The other thing is that your well-being matters because what you're being asked to do is, is difficult and complex work and we need our well-being to, to draw on to enable us to actually deliver what we need to do. I think a key part of this is one of the things we know about teaching from the literature is that teaching isn't the preparation and delivery of materials that you prepare in advance. Teaching is what happens when you react to how your students respond to what you've prepared. Doing that in a classroom is complicated enough, but doing it online is even more complicated. So those moments when your students don't understand something and you provide an additional explanation or expand a little bit more or make a connection between what they've already learned and what you're trying to teach them in this moment in time or provide reassurance or guidance, that's where the real teaching work happens. And to do that online, it, it, it takes energy, it takes focus, it takes engagement. So looking after your well-being and all this really matters because if, if we all get to September, exhausted and burnt out that's actually not going to do our students any favors so we need to be thinking about that as we're thinking about what we're going to be doing through the whole course of the next few months and, and possibly the next year now within all of that i think we also need to be realistic about what it is we're doing where we are at the moment what we're dealing with and, and what is practical and possible and I think part of that is about looking at what we've done. Now, what the work that universities and academics have done the country and all over the world, in fact, have done in the last few months has been nothing short of remarkable. The ability to actually suddenly erect learning in an online space has been amazing. I mean, it, it, it's been a minor miracle and, and people deserve huge amounts of congratulation and thanks for the work that they have done. And students have definitely benefited from that. But we should be realistic about what it is that we're delivering right now. And there are a number of people who have written and talked about this, which is the fact that what we've been doing over the last few months and are likely to keep doing in the next few months isn't actually online or distance learning. There's a big literature on both of those terms and what it means and how it works. What we've been doing is what's called emergency remote teaching. And there's an article by Hodges et al. in the um, references at the end. It's probably worth looking at if you're interested in this much more. But they make the comparison with, for instance, in Afghanistan when it wasn't safe for girls to go to school, that teaching was provided by the radio. So what we've been doing is we've been trying to fill a gap in a very short space of time using a limited range of material to help us ensure that learning continues to happen. Now, the way Paul Kirshner talked about this, I think, is quite nice. So I'm going to use that as well, which is, he said, if you look at these two pictures, on the left is a picture of a well-prepared, cleaned, well-equipped surgery in an industrial country in a hospital, um, somewhere in an, industrial, in an industrial country. On the right is a field hospital. Now, in the field hospital, surgery may well be taking place. Vital operations that save people's lives may well be taking place. But you cannot say that what's happening in the field hospital is what is happening in the surgery. They're not the same environment and you cannot do the same things. So absolutely vital, but we shouldn't pretend to ourselves that we can replicate what happens in the surgery with what happens in a battlefield hospital. Similarly, we cannot transfer what happens in the classroom directly into the online sphere. And I think we should take the pressure off ourselves to attempt to do that. Because I think what happens if we do is we just give ourselves an impossible task that becomes frustrating and exhausting. And I think what we need to do instead is to rethink what we're doing. And I'm sure many people on this webinar today have already been engaged in that and have been thinking in that way. But I think it's worth just highlighting it anyway. 
Because I think one of the key elements for the circumstance that we're in, both for us, for staff, whether you're support staff or academic staff, and also for our students, is to work with acceptance. It's very easy in circumstances like this to get drawn into lots of thought patterns of what if, what if it hadn't happened, if only it hadn't happened, maybe it might not be as bad as this, maybe by September we might be able to. And all that happens is you get yourself locked into an emotional thought cycle that wears out your energy, builds up hopes followed by disappointment, which again has a negative emotional effect, impact on you. And all of the time that you're trying to push reality away and engage with how you wish the world actually was, what's actually happening is you're not really engaging with what needs to happen with the work we need to do. What we need to do is accept reality as it is. We are where we are. The situation is how it is. The limitations that are on us are the limitations we have to work with. And so the question then becomes, okay, so given all of that, how do we make this reality as good as it can possibly be for us and for our students? Now, this isn't about us just saying, well, we'll give students whatever low delivery we can and that'll do. I'm absolutely, it, it, it's, it's really important to be ambitious. It's really important to want to give our students the best possible experience that we can, both for their learning and for their well-being. But we need to do that from a position where we have accepted the reality of where we are. And that may show up, for instance, in little things like someone was sharing with me the other day that the thought process they'd gone through, which was the beginning with, how do I transfer what I've done in the classroom? I've got these really great learning activities. How do I put those online? To eventually thinking, well, actually, I can't. I need to let those go and actually think, what is it my students need to learn? What do they need to understand? What do they need to be able to do? And what's the best way for me to get them there in the sphere that I'm now delivering this in and to let good of the, go of the great work that I would normally do in the classroom and come back to that when we're back on campus. And I think that's a really important thing for all of us. And I think you working with that, us the staff working like that, but helping our students to accept that as well, I think is also really important. Um, so let's just think a little bit then about what it is that we actually know at the moment about student mental health and COVID-19. And I want to start with a note of caution here, because there's a lot that we don't actually know. It's very easy for us to make assumptions and rush into a narrative about what's going to happen with student mental health, how all of this is going to work, the huge levels of trauma we're going to see in the community. We don't know that any of that is definitely going to happen. Now, without question, we're already seeing COVID-19 having a negative impact on the mental health of some people and some students. But it's not necessarily having a negative impact on everyone. Some people actually seem to be seeing a positive impact. And it's not necessarily the case that all of our students are going to be traumatized by what they've been through. Some will, but not everyone. And we've got to be careful about not rushing into this and actually working on the basis of what's actually happening, what our students are actually experiencing and what we're actually experiencing. So evidence is now being gathered and I'm involved in some of that with Student Minds and the Smart and Student Mental Health Research Network is also doing a huge, lots of work, lots of projects running through that to also gather in lots of information about exactly what students are experiencing. Um, but as I said, what's really important is that we don't get drawn into pathologizing what are in effect normal responses to what is an abnormal situation. It's perfectly normal that some students may feel anxious about the situation they find themselves in at the moment. It's perfectly normal that some will be experiencing social isolation. Um, it's perfectly normal that some may find that their mood's going up and down a little bit in response to what's happening. Those are normal emotional responses and they're okay. It's absolutely okay to have normal negative emotional responses to what is a very real situation. Obviously, we want to help students to manage those so that they don't become long-term uh, and problematic. But in the initial response, there's nothing wrong with having a negative emotional response to what's going on. It's all right to be upset about it. It's all right to have bad days around it. It doesn't mean it's going to develop into something worse. We need to keep an eye on that, but we've got to be careful not to make assumptions. But what do we know from the early data? So let's just have a look at that. The first thing to note, and this isn't a surprise, is that obviously it's impacting very differently across the student community. Some people appear to be experiencing this uh, far worse than others. Some people much better than others. What we are seeing in some of the really early data is that university actions, however, do seem to be having an impact on student well-being. There was a study published just early this week looking particularly at um, postgraduate research student and early career researchers. And what we can see very clearly is that when universities have communicated clearly with students about what's happening, when supervisors have communicated clearly with students about what's happening, when students have felt supported, 
their well-being is much better than those students who feel the university hasn't communicated with them, hasn't been engaged, doesn't seem to be caring about them as much. So university actions matter in terms of what's going on right now. We are also seeing um, a, a steep rise in imposter syndrome. Now that's particularly for final year students, but also for final be coming into our universities next year, which is this, this feeling that somehow they're not quite good enough. Their degree isn't a real degree or their final school year qualifications aren't proper qualifications. They're not really deserving of their space in university. But it also seems to be working a little bit also in between years. Now this is exacerbated by some real learning gaps. So we're seeing also in some of the data students saying they've really struggled in some cases to, to extract learning from the online um, distance learning that universities have put in place. That they're, they're finding the learning much slower, much more difficult, and in some cases their understanding is a lot less than they would have expected. And they're therefore feeling a lot less prepared for the next academic year coming. So we need to be aware of that. Very clearly seeing social isolation emerging is a very big issue, particularly among some of our students. There are a lot of students still in university accommodation. So university accommodation, but also in private student houses where they're the only student left and have therefore been through the whole of the lockdown living on their own effectively. Particularly in affecting care leavers, estranged students, but not just those groups. So again, this is an area we, we need to be keeping an eye on. Obviously, as you would expect, some anxiety, some existential concerns about what's going on, what's the future going to look like, is there going to be any career for me, is my time doing a degree going to be wasted, all of those kinds of worries, as you might expect. And then within all of that, issues of motivation now starting to appear in some of the data that we're seeing. So students saying that they're finding it much more difficult to motivate themselves to engage with academic work. Now that's not just about the no detriment policies that have been put in place, although some students seem to be pointing the finger at that and saying, well, once I knew there wasn't a risk of me failing, I was less motivated. And I think that says something about our education system, which is concerning. But also students, we, we know from online learning generally that students do find motivation for that form of learning more difficult than being in the classroom. So it's not a surprise that many of our students are experiencing that because it does require more self-discipline. It requires you working to a particular structure. You don't have those prompts of, you know, all of your friends going being in the classroom together, of that social learning that takes place in that space that helps build up your energy and, and your motivation once again. So it's not surprising that we've seen motivation dipping. And again, anxiety tends to depress motivation. So again, not a surprise we're seeing that appearing. And then there is obviously going to, now and is going to continue to be issues around bereavement. And, and we are seeing students um, in services up and down the country, from, I know from talking to colleagues, who have lost people to COVID-19. And it's been particularly complicated by the fact that in many cases, they haven't, for instance, been able to go to funerals. Wakes haven't been taking place in places where that would normally be the case. Normal rituals around the law happening and we know that rituals are incredibly important around death and helping us to recover so that is also complicating it and many students in in therapy talking about not just that they've lost someone but they're feeling that they didn't get the chance to say goodbye um, and so we again something we need to, to be paying attention to now in terms of equality and inclusivity issues around all of that we are seeing big issues around where the the, the difference in family relationships are happening so students who don't have family to go back to or who or to family to go back to experiencing some problems. But equally, students who find themselves in homes with family where they would wish they rather weren't, where the, where the relationship with family isn't good. Um, so we, we're seeing some, some problems around that. We're also seeing that some students simply do not have the physical space to engage with study in the same way. So they might have had to go home and they're now sharing a bedroom with a sibling. There aren't quiet spaces in the house. And of course, everyone is at home, so the house is full. We're also seeing that show up in therapy, interestingly, in which we're getting students saying that they, they have a need for support with their mental health, but they simply don't have a private space in their house where they can have that conversation without being overheard. And that's not just in households where the student doesn't get on with their, their parents necessarily. In some places where they find their parents are very supportive, they still feel uncomfortable having that conversation because they just don't want their parents hearing the conversation they're having with their counsellor. So worth bearing in, that in mind as we're going through all of this. There is a, an issue about technology access. Not all students have the IT that they need, and that is definitely causing a problem for some students. And again, we are seeing, particularly for strained students and care leavers, issues around money, um, access to food, particularly for those students who have little money 
and who are also shielding because of previous health conditions. Um, students with pre-existing conditions, particularly pre-existing mental health conditions, seem to be experiencing more of an impact on their mental health than other people. So their mental health is taking a bigger dip, needing more support at the moment um, because of that. And of course, much of this is intersectional. Much of it crosses over. Some, you know, the students who are experiencing lack of physical space can also be the, the, the students who are experiencing problems with access to technology. So I'm going to pause this. I'm going to pause on a number of points along the course of this, but I'm going to pause just here to see if there are any questions just about what's going on with students at the moment. Um, and then we will pick up and, and go through the next bit. So um, I think, Heather, are you? Yes, I have. Questions? Um, yeah, no, thanks very much, Gareth. Um, I very much appreciate the fact that you started off this presentation with the message about you matter, you know, and starting with the staff you know, because it has been a bit of an ordeal, I will say, so far. Um, I can very much relate to that, the pictures that you have of the, the nice swanky hospital versus the field hospital, and that's very much what it feels like. And your points about accepting, just, you know, us accepting the situation, staff and students. And so bearing, bearing that kind of point in mind about acceptance from your, your psychotherapy background, what kind of advice can you give to someone as to, how they can let go of perfectionism, or maybe this is a question for me personally that I'm looking for the answer for. So how, any advice on that? It, it is difficult. And I think one, one of the things we say in the sector is it's a sector full of people who want to do brilliant work and who want to really deliver the very best for their students and the very best research. Um, so it, it's a, it's, it is a problem generally. I think the, I think the issue in terms of coming back to that is you, is to, is to bring your thoughts back to reality, bring your thoughts back to the world as it actually is. Because, um, you know, the, the, the Buddha talked about the fact that, the, the fact that you know, um, all misery springs from expectation. If you, if you put on top of yourself the expectation that you can somehow create something perfect in, with the resources that we have, in the, inevitably you're going to be disappointed. If you instead focus on the reality of where we are, the situation where we are, what we have available to us, and how do I do as brilliant as possible right now, you're more likely to deliver something which is actually better than what you were hoping to do if you were trying to hang on to perfectionism. So it's not about letting go of something, of doing something really well. It's that the route to doing something really well is through the reality that we're in right now. If you, if you don't engage with reality as it is, you can't make real improvements. It's something we see in therapy a lot, actually, is that the first step very often is accepting, this is the reality I'm in, how do I change it? Whereas if you try to, to avoid the reality in your own mind, you can't make changes to it and therefore you, you're still in the, stuck in the position which isn't good. It, it can be tricky, but I think focusing on doing as well as we can with what we've got and trying to be as brilliant as possible rather than being perfect is really impossible, is important. I'll try and take that on board. I've just got, I've got one other question at this point um, before carrying on with the presentation. You mentioned about um, perhaps final year students feeling um, they're having imposter syndrome. Um, anything we can message and help our students with around about that point? Yeah, I think one of the things is it, it, it's, a, it's a problem with the way our education system has gone, which is that we've fallen into the trap of thinking that education is about getting grades you know, the whole purpose of education is to get a grade, to get a bit of paper. And it's a, it's a mistake. It's not. I mean, the first universities, certainly the first university at Bologna, the student, most of the students didn't take the final exam because that wasn't what it was about. They could just say, I've been to the university. I've been immersed in all of this learning. And that was enough. Um, this whole obsession with grades and exams is something which came along much, much later. Um, and so I think it's about emphasizing to students that the degree is not the final grade. The degree is not the final piece. The degree is or four years you've spent engaged in learning. It's all of the knowledge and understanding and skill and expertise that you have amassed because the grade won't be of any use to you when you step into the workplace. If you step into the workplace and go, well, by the way, I've got a 2-1, no one's going to care. What they care is, what can you do? What can you actually do with this learning and knowledge and understanding and wisdom that you've acquired by being at university? And so that, I think, is where we need to put our students' focus, is to say, look, forget the grade. What did you learn? How have you grown and developed? How are you a different person now from who you were when you started? Because that is what being at university is about. That's, that's the change that it makes in all of us, and that's why going to university is worth it. It's not the grade you get at the end. That's just a byproduct. 
Thanks for that. I think there's a, a agreement with what you're saying there in, in some of the, the chat as well. But um, is it okay if you carry on just now? We'll take more yeah. questions at your next point. Thanks very much. No problem. So let us move on into a number of myths that I just want to flag up because I think they're worth being aware of. Um, so let's start with this one. The idea that our students are digital natives um, and that they are therefore in some way different from us. And I've even seen some people suggest that they have therefore evolved differently. Young people have evolved a different brain because they've been engaged in all of this online technology and working with these electronic things. Um, their brain is a human brain. It's the same as all human brains. Um, the human brain is plastic. It moves around. It responds to what we do. It responds to our environment. But it is still fundamentally a human brain. What our students know how to do is to use the technology they've already been using. They might know how to use WhatsApp or whichever new app people are using, younger people are using now that I probably don't know about because it appeared last week and I'm out of date already. Um, but that's what they need to know. But because they know how to do that, it doesn't mean they know how to use a learning platform. It doesn't know they know how to use, mean they know how to use teams. And we also need to think about the diversity of our student population and that they're not all tech savvy 18 year olds. You know, there are many mature students who haven't used that kind of technology. Very interesting. I was having a conversation with some healthcare academics earlier in the week who were talking about their students, many of whom have actually been pulled onto wards during the COVID-19 pandemic and, and have been working in ICUs in places where they wouldn't normally have been, have been and experiencing all kinds of things that, that are really very difficult. But what a lot of them were saying was they'd received a message earlier in the week to say that some of their learning was now going to be happening through Teams. And the idea of having to learn another platform was the thing that was making them go, do you know what, that's enough. I'm going to quit. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to step away. Now, that was coming on top of a whole lot of other stuff, but it was the one more technology to learn that was actually the trigger to make them go, oh, too much. So we shouldn't assume that our students are all automatically going to be comfortable with using the online technology that we're asking them to use right now. We shouldn't, as I've said earlier, assume that all students have the technology to hand that they can use, or all staff for that matter. You know, not every member of staff is, is equipped with the technology that you know, a university is equipped with, and we shouldn't make the assumption that everyone is in the position to do that. We also shouldn't assume that students know how to find knowledge online. There's this pervasive thing that, you know, we don't need to teach knowledge anymore because they can find it in Google. And this, of course, is how fake news arises because you can find all kinds of stuff uh, on Google. It doesn't necessarily equate to knowledge. And there's been a lot of work done which finds that actually what people do when they're looking for knowledge online like that is that they're surface hopping. It's called the butterfly distraction. You just hop from one thing to another without ever really engaging in anything in real depth and building any real understanding. So actually we shouldn't assume our students are able to do that. We also have got to be careful about a lot of the narrative at the moment which says that what's happening now can map out the future of HE. That oh this shows that we can everything can move online automatically. As I've said we haven't done online learning in the last semester. We've been doing emergency remote teaching. And while students have been very understanding about that and have been very appreciative of the efforts their academics have gone to, we shouldn't kill ourselves that their learning is necessarily going to be of the same quality as to what they would have had in the classroom under those circumstances. So just some things to bear in mind as we move through that. One other thing I wanted just to throw out is the, this idea of cognitive load theory, Sweller's idea of cognitive load theory, which I think is really important for anyone who's teaching to, to know about. And this is the idea that we all have a very large long-term memory, but a small restricted short-term working memory. And that working memory can become overloaded and then impact on our ability to learn and engage in problem solving. For many of our students, they are having to learn to use a new online learning platform. They're also having to learn to learn online, which is a different way of learning. It's a different way of engaging with learning. And by the time they're finished with doing all of that, for some of them, there's very little cognitive capacity left for them to actually engage in disciplinary learning. So when we're doing this, particularly when we come back next year, I think it's really important that as part of the scaffolding that we put into our curriculum plan, that we are explicitly teaching our students to use the platform and to learn online and then to engage in disciplinary knowledge in a more in-depth way and not to ask them to do it all at once because if they do, the likelihood is that their working memory is just going to be overloaded and they're going to miss a lot of learning as a result. So I think that's just a really important mark to put in there because what happens if, that, if, if students experience that is that their anxiety is likely to rise, the imposter syndrome that they might have walked in with at the beginning is likely to rise, 
some of our students are just going to be experiencing so much negative emotion in response to that, that they're just going to want to push it all away and walk away. And we will lose students as a result who otherwise could have been very successful students. So let's now, I've, I've broken down some things that I think are probably worth us thinking about as we go through uh, th this whole period. And the, one of the first ones I want to focus on is, is that issue, which is that what matters is not the technology. And particularly, this is important for us as members of staff to remember, because we can be, um, we can feel like we're not using the technology properly. We're not using it to its full capacity. There are all these whistles and bells that I could be using that I'm not using. None of that matters anything like as much as the relationship between us and our students. The relationship between your and your students is far more important than the technology because good pedagogy is founded on that relationship, on your ability to respond to them, to give them feedback, to give them reassurance, to re-explain. And if, I mean, we've seen again in some of the data that came out in the, in the last few months, that when students feel that their academics understand them, about them, make effort for them, their own well-being benefits enormously, as does their learning. Um, as I said at the beginning, your well-being matters, and this is one of the reasons, because you have to have the capacity to show this and to demonstrate this. So I think what's really important is to focus down on the pedagogy of this, on coaching, on sequencing properly, on, build, on using scaffolding in our curriculum, so teaching students. So, and if there is a learning gap, if we're finding that students, there is a learning gap, filling in that gap explicitly with them, helping them to fill that in, making sure that we're providing opportunities for students to pick up any learning that they need. There's a, a basic good principle in this, which is that if, if you want students to do something, teach it to them first and don't make assumptions that they're coming with that knowledge and that ability already. Um, and then help them to grow and develop it so that they're able to use it autonomously later. But don't get too worked up about the technology, not least because as I said, not all students are going to have the most up-to-date computers, the most up. Some are going to be trying to watch you on a phone that's not particularly new. And the more complicated you make the technology, the less able some students are going to be to engage with that. So focus on teaching. The, the principles of teaching don't change. And there's a long history of this, by the way. If you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, people were predicting that we could get rid of teachers in a few years and replace them with records. Um, and then it was about we could replace them with television. Um, and so, you know, this idea that we could replace teachers at some point with something, some technology, is an old one. It's just that technology moves around. Teaching matters. Teaching is still important, both for learning and for the well-being of our students. The second thing that I think can be really helpful for our students is if we as staff talk about and model good well-being. Now, I'm not suggesting here that you start providing individual advice or trying to become a counsellor or try to become a um, kind of like a life guru or anything like that to your students. But acknowledging the situation that we are in, recognizing that it may not be ideal, and then looking at how we make the best of it is good modeling. There's a, there's a, a thing called academic candor, which Liz Malloy down in Australia talks about, which is about academic staff and those of us in university staff generally being willing to show our working to students because sometimes what they see from us, for instance, particularly from academic staff, are really work, well worked out presentations, really intelligently put together classes, papers that are polished and have been peer reviewed and published in academic journals. And what they're not seeing is the drafting process, the mistakes we made, the things we get wrong, the effort we have to go into. And that can then contribute to that, their sense of imposter syndrome. They're looking at the gap between them and us. So whilst being able to say, look, this isn't ideal. I don't know the technology particularly well, but you know what? If we work together, we can definitely deliver something really helpful, really good, that's going to be really good for your learning, really good for your growth and development as a student, really good for your well-being. And, you know, we can, I think, as all as individuals, help talk about things that benefit us and that benefit other people. And there are some things that have got a really good evidence base behind them in terms of things that, that help well-being, help health, help mood overall. So I'll just, I'll share a few of those with you now. Feel free to take away the ones that make most sense to you. The first one I'm going to talk about is sleep. And anyone who's heard me speak before knows I can talk about the importance of sleep for months on end without breaking if people give me the chance. Sleep is crucially important to our well-being. It um, is implicated in, in a whole number of um, mental health disorders, um, including some of the more significant and serious disorders like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. 
but also just in terms of managing day-to-day -day mood. Um, it's for our physical health, but also for learning. Um, so in our sleep, we clear away clutter from our memory to clear up space for more learning the next day. We move what we've learned during the course of the day that's important into our long-term memory while we're asleep. And we also seem to problem solve while we're asleep. So if we're not sleeping properly, it's going to impact negatively on our learning and it's also going to impact negatively on our well-being overall. So just getting good sleep, encouraging your students to get off their screens, to have a good sleep habits, good sleep, and there's lots of advice online you can find about that, is really important. The music we know um, is more quick, uh, changes our mood more quickly than anything else um, because it acts in more parts of our brain and it can raise our mood very quickly. 15 minutes of your favorite music a day has been shown to raise your mood in a sustained way and in a significant way. So it's statistically significant, particularly if what you listen to is upbeat music. Um, exercise we know is really helpful at managing anxiety and at raising mood. It also appears to improve learning. So people who exercise, if you exercise more regularly, we know it also seems to be implicated in creativity. So if you get stuck on something, if you're struggling in problem solving and you go for a walk, you're more likely to solve the problem while you're walking than if you continue to just sit behind your computer. Things like mindfulness, meditation, yoga, all have a very solid evidence base behind them in terms of a positive impact on your well-being overall. Fun, and I'm, I put that in there because sometimes students don't expect to hear that from us, but actually fun has a really important role to play in our well-being overall. We need pleasure. We need some pleasure in our lives. Now, it's important to get the balance of that between kind of pleasure and purpose and social connectedness, but fun matters. And at the moment, that might be difficult for some of our students. So encouraging them to think about, well, what could you do in this circumstance that would be fun? Yes, you might not be able to do all those things you wish you could do. Again, accepting, coming back to reality. So what could you do that might be fun, um, that might help? Focusing on now and what can be controlled, I think is a really important part of all of this. Many students are experiencing, many individuals, actually whole societies are feeling of control due to what's been happening, that they, they aren't able to control this huge thing that's raging around them globally. And, and we can't, and if we attempt to do that or, or, or focus our attention on it, again, we're likely to become exhausted and frustrated. So what we need to do is to bring our attention back to, okay, so what can we do now? What do I have influence over? What do I have control over? How can I focus on that? What can I do about that here, now, in the moment? I think coming back to the moment is really important when something is going on. But it is also important to remember that the future hasn't gone away. This will pass. We will figure this out. We, we, there will be a point at which we come through this. Now, reality might not look exactly as it did before all of this happened, but we will go back to a functioning society where we are able to mix and see each other again. Universities will go back to something like the model we knew before. So this will pass. It will move on. We can't make it happen. We can't identify the point at which that will happen, but it will happen. Staying connected to others however we can is really important. If we have other people that we can see physically, that helps. And using, I know that in Scotland today, there's been announced that, um, people are going to be more able to see each other in social situations, providing they are outside and socially dis distancing. Um, that's really good. Seeing each other online, being able to visually see each other is really important. That helps. Telephone, text, all of these things can be really helpful in maintaining that sense of social connection. Finding gratitude where you can, and that again is another thing that's been proven to be really good for our well-being. If you can find things in the day you're grateful for. Now, these can be small things. It can be, I had a really nice sandwich at lunch. It can be, I made a great cup of coffee or I had a lovely telephone call with a friend. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But identifying two or three things in the day that you're grateful for has been shown to boost well-being significantly over a sustained period of time. And then the last thing, I just want to point to the little robin. The robin's my favorite bird, which is something in nature. And again, there have been a number of studies which have shown that if you engage in nature mindfully for about 10 minutes a day, there is a significant and sustained positive impact on your well-being overall. So there are lots of small, little things that we can do that despite the circumstance we find ourselves in, can have a boost to our well-being. It's not a miracle solution. It's not a want to make everything better. But they are little things that we can do and model and show to each other that can help us to manage the situation better and make our mood and well-being a little bit better. So I'll pause there, see if there are any more questions, Heather, if there's anything else people want to ask. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Gareth. Um, I think I'll maybe just raise one of the questions um, that's coming in various formats from different people. 
So have you got any suggestions as to how we can foster a cohort development community and support in a socially distanced world? I think in particular, people are raising about, you know, you've got the two different groups of students. You've got the students who already know each other already and are carrying on into later years of the programme. But now we're going to be in the situation where we've got the new students arriving and they haven't physically met their fellow students yet. So any suggestions about the kind of socialization, the cohort development? Yeah, and, and again, the, 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 there isn't an ideal solution to this and we should just acknowledge that that's the case. You know, the ideal solution is you get everybody in a room because that's the way human beings have always got to know one another. We are probably gonna have to work with online solutions for a while. Um, so it might be about how we explicitly think about where that goes into the curriculum. If you, you know, recognize that we need to build cohort identity, where can we create space to allow that to happen? So I know like Blackboard Collaborate and, and, and Google Classrooms and things like that usually have breakout rooms that you can create where you can put smaller groups of students together to actually have conversations with each other. I think it's also really important that as universities, we think about creating informal online social space that's within the university online environment, but that isn't mediated by us as staff so that students can have the kind of conversations they would have with each other as they come out of the classroom. You know, I didn't get that. I didn't understand any of that, did you? So they can have that without worrying about their lecture or overhearing it or, over, or, or seeing it. And not assuming that students will necessarily be able to do that on apps, because what we do find is that sometimes you'll get some students who will put together, say, a WhatsApp group, but you might have some mature students who don't use WhatsApp who then get left out or some other students who, maybe international students who aren't used to using that app who then, don't, who then get left out. So I think creating an online university space that everyone then gets introduced to, shown how to use, and is asked to use for that purpose, I think is really important. And I think this is just about, again, as I say, if we think about the scaffolding that we're going to do, not rushing to content, not necessarily rushing to disciplinary content, but spending some time at the beginning of the year setting up the learning environment with everyone, making sure everyone knows how they can use it, giving people the opportunity to talk to each other. That may be through the discipline. So what you can do with people is you can create online conversations and say to people, you know, here is a thing about this discipline in groups of four in breakout rooms, have conversations about what you think about that and get to know each other that way. I know then in some pre-entry sessions, I've even just very basic things sometimes where I've said, put students in groups and said, introduce yourself, say who you are, where you're from, and why you're studying the subject you're studying, just to get people talking. It's, it's a bit artificial doing it online, but it's better than nothing. And I think better to pay attention to it and do that than to just hope it'll somehow work out itself. And the other thing I would say is, let's not forget about when people eventually do come back onto campus, and I'll come back to that at the end of the webinar, because I think we've got to not assume that once they come back, it's all going to work fine as well. But I think it, it's not ideal. But depending on the size of the group you've got and, and things like that, I think working with something explicit, and at, at the very least, if you show you care about it and that you think it's important, it's a marker to students to do something about it. That's great, thanks. We'll pick up any other final questions at the end. Thanks, Gareth. Cool. Okay, so let's pick up again on where we're going through. So then the, back to this point I was making earlier on about the importance of meta-learning and learning to learn and guiding students through the platform. So I said earlier, for instance, that you, know, if you could create um, breakout rooms. If you are creating breakout rooms, please explicitly show students how to use it. Um, walk them through it. Um, drop into the room to make sure that they're using it and they know how to use it and that everybody's guessing it. Um, be willing to hold your hand up with somebody who's had to learn this and found it difficult and complicated so that other people, students themselves, find that normalized. They're not thinking, oh, I'm stupid because I don't know how to make this work. Because a lot of students will be in that situation and that is how they will feel. So normalizing the fact that we're all trying to figure out how you make this technology work as well as you can. All right to not know. And that it's all right to be shown once and to still have forgotten and to have to ask again because that's a normal part of learning, learning it, forgetting it, relearning it. That's how learning works a lot of the time. And so that that's all okay. And normalizing that experience as much as possible. And also just given some techniques about online learning and how you use these online tools really well. So we know even just from when we were all still in the classroom with things like um, lecture capture, um, we know that students who use lecture capture really well, what they do is they go, they, they think about what they've learned in the lecture focus on the bits that they didn't understand and go back and re-watch those bits. Students who have less well-developed study skills 
just go and try and rewatch the whole of the lecture all over again. So giving students guidance to think about how they can use these learning think tools effectively so that, you know, you, you've got this, you might prefer to be in the classroom, but the great thing is you are going to have the recording. Don't rewatch the whole lot of it. Watch it. Go make some notes. Think about what you've got and where the gaps are. Go back and rewatch the bit where there are gaps to build up that understanding and that that's likely to be more effective. Do warn them about having other things open when they're engaged with the learning because, I mean, I'm guessing now most of you are probably actually have your emails open or something else open while you're doing this. Um, and we know that when that happens, your overall cognitive engagement with what you're learning drops and actually your IQ falls. And just having your phone sitting by you with notifications switched on is enough to take off on a number of IQ points. So giving them those kinds of warnings and guides to help them engage with the learning online. Uh, I, I think is really important because then they will feel that they are learning. And when our students feel that they're learning well, what that does is it builds up their confidence. It, it builds up their academic self-efficacy. They, they can notice and see the learning. And then that confidence builds in a positive cycle. Whereas if they feel they're not learning, if they feel they've drifted away and they've missed stuff and they're not engaged with it, that can make them start to feel alienated from the material. They start to doubt. Um, and then you, they st might start getting thoughts about, this isn't for me, this isn't working well. Um, and either that's the university's fault or it's my fault because I'm not good enough. And then I think this is a, a really important point that a number of people have talked about and people like Paul Kirshner, which is that when you're moving this stuff to online and they have all this other stuff that students are having to learn, what's really important is that we simplify what we're doing. So let me explain what I do mean by that and what I don't mean by that. First of all, it may mean using shorter sessions on breaking up longer sessions with time to step away from the screen and really encouraging people to step away from the screen. It's very difficult to maintain conversation at a screen for a long period of time. And it does also appear to have a negative impact on our well-being overall. We're more likely to lose energy, lose positivity if we're stuck staring at a screen all the time. So encouraging students to get up, walk away, if possible, step outside, get some fresh air, move around. It'll lift their mood, it'll lift their engagement and their energy levels and they'll be more able to learn afterwards. Think about the curriculum and what it is that you actually need your students to know, understand, and be able to do. And think about how you might be able to strip that back to create more space to fill in any gaps in their learning that they might have already, and that kind of meta-learning around learning online. So what can you strip back? What is it that your students actually need to know? And then if possible, rebuild your modules around the, the core bits. It might mean you're losing some extra stuff, but that is stuff we can put back in later on. We can look at doing that, providing we've got the right building blocks in place. Really think about the sequencing of what you're teaching your students. And generally what appears to be best is to start at a high level um, and then you know, and come back out and refer it back out to the high level again. And that then builds students' confidence that they're understanding the whole subject. They're seeing how it all ties together. And that boosts their well-being overall. Now I'm not saying make it easy. I'm not saying make this academically easy for students to do or dumb down your course. Challenge is really good, but we do have to be aware of the amount of cognitive loading that our students can take in one go. Now, later in the semester, when they're hopefully more confident with the learning platform, they're more confident with learning online, you can up the amount you're putting in, you can up the amount of complexity that you're throwing at them, but we do need to build from simple to begin with to make sure that they're confident with learning in this way before we, we sort of increase the complexity. So staying focused as much as possible and also keep the text simple. Try not to put too many whistles and bells on this that rely on students having technology they may not have. Always worth coming back to say to yourself, if they've only got a phone, can they do this on a phone? Um, and if you can keep it simple, and remember pedagogy, not technology, you talking to students, with some useful resources that they can read and use and watch. That's teaching, that's learning. Focus on how you're teaching, how it's being sequenced, how you're linking things together. That's the bit that matters rather than the technology because that might be the thing that trips them up and alienates them. And I guess what I'm talking about really here is scaffolding. And I'm a big fan of Sally Kipp's work on transition pedagogy, which is that idea that you focus on who your students are and where they are. We have to acknowledge that our students are learning at this time in this moment their learning has been disrupted already they've got they're going to have some learning gaps they might not be as comfortable with the online learning and they're doing all of this while there is this pandemic 
going on in society around and outside them. So we have to teach them in that circumstance, because if we ignore that, they're going to fill the gap between where they are and what they're being taught, and they're going to feel that they're falling into that, um, and that then is going to undermine their confidence and their, their belief in their own ability to do this. So it may be very useful at the beginning of this year to actually start your year by trying to test out where your students are, what they know, what they don't, and where the gaps are. And if there are specific things that your students need to know and need to be able to do to engage with your module, check they've got it. Because they may have it under normal circumstances, they may not have it now. And that's in all years. Um, and, and I think that the other one is, is we, we know that students being able to see the narrative of their program is very important. When students cannot see the, the relevance of what they're learning, um, when, they, when they can't see how it attaches to everything else or why it's important, that seems to have a negative impact on their emotions. They seem to become more frustrated, um, more despondent, more alienated, more disengaged from their learning overall. So if any time that you spend helping students see the relevance of what you're teaching them is never lost. Any time you spend helping students connect what they're learning to previous learning is never lost because it strengthens and improves the learning, makes it feel more relevant to them, increases their sense of, of identifying with their discipline and with their subject, and therefore makes them feel that they belong more and are part of this much more. And then we talked about, there was the question just then about, about socializing, which, which I've said earlier on, you know, please don't assume that all students are going to be adept at using social media because they won't. Um, and do try to create spaces for students to interact both in lessons and outside if you possibly can. But again, teach students to use it. The other thing is don't forget you're part of that social picture. So if you can be as responsive as possible when you're teaching um, and outside to an extent that doesn't impact on your well-being. But if you can be responsive to your students, that is part of their social picture. And again, if you think about the study that we saw earlier this week of the postgraduate research student and early career researcher um, data, again, what it showed was where students felt that their supervisor had responded and been clear with their instruction and clear with their guidance and support, those students also felt less social and less lonely. So the way you respond to your students will have an effect on how they feel socially as well. So it's not just about the social relationships they have with their students. It's also, again, the relationship with you really matters. Do please ensure they know what support is available because it's very easy for students to miss this or to assume that support isn't available because we've moved online. Most universities are now providing support online. Certainly my university is, and I say I work as a psychotherapist, so I've been doing online therapy sessions with our students. Um, make sure students know how to connect with your support services. So, and think about that broadly. I mean, think about study skills, mental health teams, counseling teams, careers teams, chaplaincy, student union, all of those kinds of areas. Very simply, if you can create a slide for yourself that you put into any slide decks that you're putting together, or you know, send that information to students but remind them of it on a regular basis um, so that if they are experiencing difficulty then th they can go in that direction you can signpost them one of the things we know again from the research and some of the research that we did um, a couple of years ago when we looked at the role that academics actually play in supporting student mental health is that the way in which you signpost students to services has a really important effect on whether or not they go to those services. So if you simply are, are sort of kind of going, well, there's some services over there, I'm not quite sure what they're doing, students much less likely to access. If you're saying there's a service over there, it's really good, I've had students go to it before, they've really benefited from it, I really think you would benefit, much more likely to go and access that service. So thinking about how you're framing it, but you just putting it out there and highlighting that, you think it's good for students to access that support, that you think it will be helpful, that you think it's important, that sign, that signifier to your students is on its own a demonstration that you care, but it also takes away some of the stigma that they may feel about going and accessing those services. And therefore we may get students at an earlier point prior to some of their problems developing and becoming much more severe. And the other thing I want to say is that we are all at the moment very focused on the first time, and of course we are. Um, and I know Cambridge have already said that they're going to go online completely for next year. But whenever students come back on campus, we can't assume they're going to be ready and okay 
to just simply re-engage off the bat. Many of them will have been through all kinds of different scenarios. Some of them won't have been on campus before at all. They won't know the buildings. They won't know how to get around. Being in a classroom will be new. And they'll be meeting people physically for the first time, probably including you. So when we have students back on campus, it's a final plea for me is, can we please think about inducting them back onto campus as if they were their students coming in on their first day. But all of the things you would think about doing for first year students when they arrive on their first day, let's do that for all of our students when they come back in so that we can welcome them back in, make them feel they belong back in the classroom with us. And just some final reasons to be cheerful for me, just to simply say, this will pass. Some good things may come out of it. Your students will appreciate the effort that you put in. We're seeing that very clearly where lecturers making the effort, even if things don't work, even when there are technological glitches, students will forgive that if they see the effort that you are making. You never know, government may look at all of this and think, well, if we've got through this year without all of these tech bureaucratic things, maybe we should do in future. But crisis sometimes does focus us on what's important and maybe we'll recalibrate our future and make it a better one where our work-life balance in universities is better. Who knows? We might get there if we put the pressure in the right place. But we will survive this. Universities have come through worse. We will be here after that. Uh, this will pass, but let's look after ourselves in the meantime and then look after our students. Um, and I think everyone will learn something as we go through it and hopefully we'll all emerge from it sooner rather than later. So Heather, final questions. Uh, yeah, thank you very much there, Gareth. Um, yeah, just one question really, because I'm aware of the, the time. Just bearing in mind all the points that you've raised very helpfully throughout your presentation, what, what do you see, broadly speaking, are the key potentially new skills that academic staff will need to develop as we move forward? I think I think I would focus back on the, the skills that, that academics have all have always been important in in working with students are the ones that are still going to be important. This is still a human thing. The fact that we're working through technology doesn't take away that this is these are still human relationships. The human bit is the bit that's still most important. I guess what it might help us to think about a little bit more is is how we've put our curriculum together. It might help us to revisit it and maybe some learning about how we put our curriculums together, how we sequence them, how we bring them together. Maybe we'll learn a bit more about that and understand it so that when we bring stuff back into the classroom, it might be refreshed a bit more and might be a bit more focused and targeted and focused on how students learn rather than on how we've wanted to put the content together. But I think the human bit is, is, is and remains the most important thing that I would want people to be focused on. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm just aware that's pretty much us running up to the hour here just now. So I would just like to say a, a massive thank you, Gareth, for another fantastic and thought-provoking presentation. Um, particularly appreciate the fact that you've got practical, sensible ideas for us to um, consider, not just for the students, but also to look after ourselves. For example, around about acceptance, mindfulness, normalizing. We will get through it, positive messages. And thank you to everyone for joining in today and for um, engaging in the chat, although distracting and losing IQ points in the process, I do realise that. Um, so as mentioned earlier, everyone, the recording of this session will be made available on the cluster webpage after the webinar. So please feel free to source that there, circulate it amongst your networks as you see fit. And thanks again, everyone, for joining with us. Bye just now. <laughs>